This brand new electric car just set a track record at the Goodwood Festival of Speed. And in this video, we're gonna break down the technology behind the car and see how it could literally drive upside down on the ceiling with no assistance. It's called the McMurtry Spearling and it was just unveiled at the Goodwood Festival of Speed where it ran a 39 second lap, which is officially the fastest lap ever run there. So first we're gonna take a look at the high points of this car and then we're gonna deep dive into some specific areas. This thing is a one seater electric vehicle that is intended to be driven on the road and the track, so it will be street legal. It has two electric motors on each rear wheel and it has a 60 kilowatt hour battery pack. They're claiming a 300 plus mile range, which is really impressive for that small of a pack. And it will have a thousand horsepower and only a thousand kilogram curb weight. And this is just the beginning because they're claiming 2000 kilograms of downforce at zero miles an hour, zero to 60 in under 1.5 seconds and cornering capabilities of three plus G's, which is equivalent to an LMP1 race car. Let's see how this car achieves these crazy metrics. To start, I'm gonna talk about conventional downforce and the basics of how it works. There's a physics concept called Bernoulli's principle, which basically states that the faster a fluid moves, the lower its pressure and vice versa. The slower a fluid moves, the higher its pressure. Below is a diagram of an airplane wing. We can see that on the top of the wing, we have faster moving air and under the wing, we have slower moving air and that creates a pressure differential between the top and the bottom of the wing, which actually applies a force to the bottom of the wing and creates lift. And if you're trying to conceptualize what pressure means, it's basically force over area. And you can actually think about the units pounds per square inch in the US. You're applying a force pounds and it's per square inch, which would be the area. So that's just an easy way to think about it. So if you invert an airplane wing, you get a spoiler. And that's what you see on a lot of race cars and some cars that probably shouldn't have them on the road. So it's the exact opposite. The top of the wing deflects air. So it's slower moving air, which creates a higher pressure zone. Below the wing, air is moving a lot faster. It creates a low pressure zone. And so that pressure differential is actually gonna create a force downward, hence how we get downforce. Later on in the video, I'm gonna talk about why downforce is so good for going fast. But first, we're gonna talk about the drawbacks. And the main drawback, aside from maybe the car looking kind of funky, is that when you add downforce, you're gonna have to increase drag at least to some degree. And this downforce efficiency can be described using something called the drag to lift ratio. In simple terms, drag to lift ratio is basically how much downforce is gained for the increased drag we're adding. And on a Formula One car, I found a source online that said it's around 2.5. So that means that for every kilogram of drag they're creating, they're creating 2.5 kilograms of downforce. So if we look at a really quick Formula One example using the numbers I just quoted, a drag to lift ratio of 2.5. For every 100 kilograms of drag penalty we wanna take on, we would then gain 250 kilograms of downforce. An F1 car weighs about 800 kilograms and at 100 miles an hour, an F1 car makes about 800 kilograms of downforce. So you can do the math there to see the drag penalty. But we do know for sure that downforce creates drag and that is the huge drawback F1 cars have really high coefficients of drag, as high as one on some cars, but the actual number is really hard to find. So I have 0.7 quoted here. It's somewhere between 0.7 and one, which is over double what an economy car that drives on the road is. The McMurtry on the other hand makes downforce in a completely different way. This car has two massive fans that require over 80 horsepower. And what they do is suck air from the bottom of the car and shoot it out the back. And that creates a vacuum effect with the car and the ground to produce a ton of downforce. If you're curious why I put a shop vac on the screen, those things are generally around two to five horsepower. So you could think about how powerful an 80 horsepower fan is. It's moving a ton of air and creating a ton of suction under the car. On your screen here is a comparison between traditional downforce and this fan created downforce. On the left, we have our traditional setup with body panels, spoilers, etc. And downforce will increase proportional to the square of the velocity. So you could imagine at 20 miles an hour, the downforce is X. And at 40 miles an hour, the downforce is going to be four times that. On the right is a graph of the fan method. We have peak downforce at zero miles an hour. And that stays constant through whatever speed you want. Essentially, what I'm trying to say is the downforce with the fan method does not depend on speed. You can create downforce whenever you want it. Cool, so we talked about what downforce is, how it's produced. 
but why is it so important? If you've watched racing, you definitely know the answer to this, but if you don't know, downforce increases grip of the car, and increased grip allows you to accelerate faster, allows you to corner faster, and it allows you to brake faster. An easy way to think about it is you increase the maximum acceleration in any direction, forward, backward, left, right, the car is a lot more planted to the ground. We're gonna get to some actual figures, but first I just wanna walk through a really quick explanation of how friction works. You can calculate the force of friction using a really simple equation. Force is equal to mu, which is the coefficient of friction, multiplied by n, the normal force. And the normal force is just the weight. And it's really easy to conceptualize if you think about pulling a box like in this photo here. If you had someone stand on the box, it becomes a lot harder to pull. And that's because that normal force or weight is increasing. And if you put that box on a surface like sand, it would also become a lot harder to pull. And that's because that coefficient of friction is gonna go up. Tire friction is a lot more complicated, but you can model it in the same way as a person pulling a box. You have the coefficient of friction, which is between the tire and the road surface, and you have the normal force, which is just the weight of the car or the force that's pushing down on the tire. Again, this is a lot more complicated. We're simplifying friction a lot. A tire can go through a lot of different conditions and achieve very different friction results. So just take this with a grain of salt. So we're gonna get into an example here where you're actually gonna see some concrete numbers finally. So the 2019 Corvette ZR1 can stop from 70 miles an hour in just 127 feet. This is one of the shortest stopping distances of any production car. With those numbers, you can actually calculate the acceleration of the car as it's stopping. So you take one half multiplied by the velocity it's going divided by the stopping distance. And this is all in metric, so I did the conversions. And you realize that the average acceleration is about 1.3 Gs. And you can actually calculate the friction force that the tires are experiencing with the road. So you take the weight of the car, 1700 kilograms, multiply it by the acceleration, and you see that the friction force is about 21,500 newtons, which is quite a bit. Now that we know how much force the tires are exerting on the ground to slow the car down, we can actually calculate the coefficient of friction. So we use our equation from before and solve for mu, and we see that mu or coefficient of friction is equal to 1.29. And if you notice, that's exactly equal to the average acceleration of the stopping run. So we know that mu is equal to acceleration and mu is gonna be the main determining factor in how fast we can stop. So we just looked at stopping distance on a really high-end streetcar. Now we're gonna look at stopping distance on a Formula One car. According to a 2008 article I read, so the figures might be even better now, a Formula One car can stop from 200 kilometers an hour in only 213 feet. Using the same methods as before, you see that average acceleration is 2.4 Gs and the force going to the ground is about 19,000 Newtons. So we're gonna assume for a second that the Formula One car has no downforce, which is obviously not the case. With no downforce, we can calculate the coefficient of friction and we see that mu is equal to 2.42, which is a really big number. If you look back to the Corvette calculation, we came up with 1.3 for mu, and that is a top of the line street tire, arguably partial track tire, a Pilot Sport Cup 2. So there's no way that a Formula One tire has twice the traction as a top of the line street tire. So let's do another calculation where we do account for downforce. Force of friction is equal to mu multiplied by the car weight plus the downforce. We have our same stopping power, 19,000 newtons, and this time we're gonna assume that mu is a bit better than the best street tire at 1.5. So we're gonna solve for X, which is our downforce figure, and we see that in order to achieve this stopping distance, there's about 490 kilograms of average downforce. And just for reference, a Formula One car makes around its weight in downforce at 100 miles an hour. So this does seem to be about right for mu, I would imagine mu on a Formula One tire is between 1.4 and 1.8. Now let's look at the McMurtry fan car and see what kind of stopping power it has. So we're gonna make a couple assumptions. One is that mu or coefficient of friction of the tires is 1.29, same as the Corvette ZR1 tire. And there's 2000 kilograms of constant downforce from those fans quoted by McMurtry. That's basically like a Tesla Model Y is sitting on the roof of this car, pushing it into the ground, which is ridiculous. So we're gonna use our same equation from earlier. Force is equal to mu times car weight plus downforce. Mu is 1.29. We multiply by 
our car weight, 1,000 kilograms, plus our downforce, 2,000 kilograms. And we see that the max friction force is 38,000 newtons. You can then calculate max theoretical acceleration, and this will be negative acceleration because you're stopping. So you take 38,000 divided by the weight of the car, 1,000 kilograms, and you see that you could pull up to 3.8 Gs of acceleration when you're stopping or accelerating this car. And if you turn that into a stopping distance starting at 70 miles an hour, you come up with 13 meters or 43 feet. So imagine this thing driving on the highway next to you and it takes two to three car lengths to stop from 70 miles an hour. That is ridiculous. So let's find out exactly how fast this thing accelerates. We're gonna move over to the motor matchup drag race simulator and see how fast it can do a quarter mile. On your screen here is the simulator with a quarter mile setup. On the top is the McMurtry fan car. On the bottom is a Tesla Model S Plaid for reference so you can see how fast this thing is. It's gonna be a quarter mile race starting from zero. And you can see off the line, it's pulling about two Gs of acceleration, gets to 60 in 1.2 seconds with that one foot rollout subtracted and it blazes through the quarter mile. It gets a 7.5 quarter mile at almost 180 miles an hour. That's a full second faster than the Model S Plaid and it's going about 25 miles an hour faster. And if you're curious about the title of the video, it should be obvious by now, but this car could actually drive upside down at any speed. So it could crawl at one or two miles an hour and drive in some sort of loop. I think this would be a great marketing stunt. I think McMurtry should probably do this. It actually has been done before by Jaguar and I think there was some Hot Wheels thing a while back, but the cars are doing like 40 to 50 miles an hour. It could literally do this at a crawling pace at one or two miles an hour and just be like a bug stuck to the ceiling. So before I wrap up the video, I just wanna walk through some kind of random calculations that I thought about. The first one is the fans use at least 80 horsepower. This is quoted by McMurtry from 2021 which is equivalent to 60 kilowatts. Conveniently, the battery pack size is 60 kilowatt hours. So in theory, you could only run the fans for an hour, and that would be if the car wasn't moving at all. So these fans demand a ton of power. The McMurtry has a coefficient of drag of an economy car. They haven't released an official figure, but they have talked about how that's a priority. And at the same time, it creates almost as much downforce as a Formula One car. So the technology in this car is incredibly impressive. And the last fact is, if you took all of those 60 kilowatts going to the fins and redirected them to the motors, you could go 100 miles an hour with just 60 kilowatts of power using a coefficient of drag of 0.35. I hope you guys enjoyed the video and I hope you learned something. If you want to check out a really cool solar EV, I'll put a box right here. Go check that out. Otherwise, I'll have all the links in the description and a pinned comment below. I'll see you guys next time.